morning, everybody. Welcome to Bethel. It's a great day that God has given us, isn't it? My name is Dave Rutzloff, and I've been around Bethel Church for quite a while. Deb and I originally uh, started attending Bethel back when Pastor David uh, Viam was the lead pastor. We love the church, we love the biblical teaching, and I want to share with you an opportunity that's coming up, and that is Alpha. If you've been around Bethel a while, you've probably heard about it, but what exactly is Alpha and why is it important? Alpha is an 11 week course that creates a space where people can come for conversation about faith, life, and God. Alpha is held in Fergus Falls, right here at Bethel, but it is run all over the world in homes and cafes, restaurants, prisons, anywhere that people can gather comfortably to have conversation and ask hard questions. I personally have been a part of Alpha for a number of years. In fact, my involvement with Alpha goes back uh, approximately now 12 or 13 years when my grandson Carter, who was eight months old, uh, died. And that was a motivating force for me, a life-changing force for me uh, to move on with my faith. And I took Alpha as a way to explore that. It's no easy task in this world to find a safe place for honest and open conversation about life's biggest questions. So church, I ask you to consider, when it comes to reaching others for Christ, here's an opportunity where all the work is done for you. You simply invite someone and you show up together. How easy is that? Is there someone on your heart you'd like to invite? Or maybe you yourself are looking for answers. This old friend of mine, Helen. My best friend. My friend called and invited me to try Alpha. Y recuerdo que mi papá me dijo, mira, hay comida gratis, ve. They handed me a invitation. It was just a random invitation. And I said like, why not, why not, let's try it. Why not, let's go. And I found like a, like a really awesome community of people. They helped me find who I was just by listening. Alpha helped me in the knowing of God. Empecé a entender que el amor de muchas maneras. I just knew. I was a different person from that moment on. I knew I had purpose. I, I felt really comfortable and like starting to invite my friends. I've seen Alpha really impact people that I work with. I would definitely encourage people to get involved. It's one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. It all turned out to be life changing. Church, there are so many opportunities here at Bethel for fellowship, Bible study, and engaging with our friends and neighbors. Those can all be found in your Sunday Bulletin or on the website. I invite you to take a look. Think about taking advantage of an event or a Bible study or Alpha, where you can be in the hands and feet of Jesus right where he has placed you in this life today. Let's focus on Jesus now together. Let's praise him as our savior who loves us and who has made a way to the Father for us. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hey everyone, Pastor Dave Foss here. Thanks for connecting with us today at Bethel. It's my prayer that this message be something that God uses in your life in conjunction with you belonging to a local church. We believe that online messages can help fill the gap when worship in your local church just isn't possible on a given weekend. Maybe you're traveling, maybe you got some health stuff going on, whatever the reason, isn't it great that we can connect like this? It is, and we're happy to share this online resource with you to encourage you till you can meet back here with us at Bethel or wherever your faith family is gathering. So again, thanks for connecting with us today and hope to see you soon. We are beginning a new series today called 
the pursuit of happiness. I think that's a pretty, like, we kind of go like, oh, that seems logical. Who, whoever sets out as a goal in life to be as miserable as possible. I've never met anyone who said, you know, my goal in life is just, you know, pretty much to be miserable. That's my hope and goal. Whenever someone is sad or, like, not happy, it's like we want to, like, get, leave that place and go to the place of happiness. That's where we want to go, right? That's pretty, lo- it's pretty understandable and accepted in our world. In fact, our Declaration of Independence and the country in the United States in 1776, and I was not there in case some of you were wondering, uh, it says this, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Right? It's there, right in our founding document as a country. It's like, of course, like we long to be happy, but how do we get there? That's the dilemma. That's what we're like going to talk about. And, and Jesus got some things to say that are going to like kind of turn us upside down a little bit. Seems like the harder we search for it, the more elusive it is. But it's in us. It's in our day. Think about how we greet one another, right? Even this holiday season, right? We say, Merry Christmas, and you reply with Merry Christmas. And if you go, bah humbug, you're like the Scrooge, right? Exactly. No one does that. Happy New Year, right? How you doing today? Did you have a good day? No, I'm not very happy. (gasps) Like, we don't say that. We go, yeah, I'm I'm good. We answer, I'm good, right? Happiness is like this kind of underlying theme or goal that we have for our life. But it seems like the harder we run after it, the more we search for it, the more we strive for it, the more elusive it seems to be. Why is that? I, and I would say it's as if we set happiness as the goal, we're going to be more and more disappointed. Because here's the reality that our world has put, we put ourselves at the center of it, and evidenced by a couple of things. I want to give a couple of quotes to you. One is from Justice Anthony Kennedy in 1992, wrote about how he determined kind of our purpose, our goal in life. Listen to this quote that he wrote in 1992 in the majority opinion in the Supreme Court Justice, Anthony Kennedy wrote this in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which doesn't really matter, but just listen to This very well-educated man, as he wrote the philosophy of our age and the assumption within our culture of what is good, true, and right. He says this, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence. Wow. Of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of life. So you can define who you are. That's at the very essence. That's an assumption. That is what's true and good. And you can decide how you're going to be happy. Carl Truman wrote about it in his book, Strange New World. Says it like this. And it's kind of a long quote. Follow along. The impact of expressive individualism on how we think about life and liberty has been dramatic. All this is because of the notion of happiness with which we now intuitively operate is one where a sense of personal psychological well-being is central. Our personal psychological well-being is central to our life. That is the goal of life. Truman states, we might say that happiness is for each of us first and foremost an individual thing. I can't tell you what makes you happy. You can't tell me. No one can tell anyone else. It's individual, resting upon us being independent. We are independent, autonomous human being. Going back to what Kennedy said, the justice, we each have the ability to our own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe. Okay, back to the quote from Truman. Happiness is for each of us, first and foremost, an individual thing resting upon us being independent. All other relationships must serve that end or be seen as oppressive. Think about what that means for relationships. If what Truman says is true of our world. And I would say yes, I think he has got it 
on the money, accurately describing our world. You kind of say, well, those are just a bunch of eggheads, you know, scholar, justice guys. Think about some common phrases that we hear today. If it hasn't put ourselves. Now, these are phrases that you could kind of go, well, that can be kind of true. But taken with this understanding of putting ourselves at the center of our world, defining our own existence, our own psychological, as, as Truman says, our own personal psychological well-being is central to our world, our life. Basically, we define who we are. We define how we're going to be happy. We define everything. Our existence is defined by ourselves, according to Justice Kennedy. Common phrases like, you do you. Uh, you need to find your voice. Be true to yourself. Follow your passion. Discover your true self. And the end all to all discussions, well, as long as they're happy, right? So you ever been in a discussion with someone and you're talking about, you know, someone has made some decisions and they end up by, and the conversation basically is ended by this phrase, well, as long as, long as they're happy. And it, it's so awkward because, I mean, who wants to be the guy who says, uh, actually, you know, it doesn't really matter if they're happy. I mean, you know, you feel like Johnny Raincloud, right? It's like, yeah, you know, that's my goal in life is to make everyone miserable. And actually, that's God's plan for your life is to make you miserable. Sorry, that's not one that's not God's plan for your life. But God's plan does not allow you to be at the center of the world. You don't get to define your own existence. You are created by him. We're just going through the Apostles' Creed and Confirmation talking about the fact that God is creator, that we are made by someone. And that has such profound implications for how we think about ourselves. That we do not get to define our own existence. And that is good news. It sets us free to be who we are. We're like, oh, we're made by God. It's not, I can't handle the weight of defining myself. It's not given to me. And actually, it's freedom. It's freedom to go, oh, I'm made by a God who loves me. And I don't, it's not up for me to de decide what's going to make me happy. I can't ha stand that way. I can't handle that weight. So it's good news. You know, and the reality is, think about that we live in a time and age where we are the most blessed financially. I mean, we never, I mean, we have so much, we have such an abundance, we have good health care, we spend so much time on entertainment, and we spend so much money on things that are kind of around the periphery, like fun, entertainment, and we are the most blessed people financially and kind of health-wise, we live the longest, we have the nicest houses, but yet, as a people, as a society, we are struggling with, with issues of mental health, and our kids are just, are just under the weight of this, and, and teen suicide is through the roof, and we are the most unhappy of people. Even though we seemingly on the outside, I mean, we have so much given to us, and we're realizing that maybe putting ourselves at the center of the world is not the answer. Maybe it's actually a recipe for disaster. Talk about this. So, this series, The Pursuit of Happiness, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to hear some things that God says are blessings, that we are blessed. And so we're going to hear some things that are going to like stretch us. It's going to be like, what? Blessed? The poor in spirit? Those who mourn are blessed. Those who hunger and thirst, those who are, who are literally hungry, are blessed. I don't know about you, but I do not like being hungry. In fact, I don't think I've ever missed a meal. I mean, I, uh, some people say, oh, I'm so busy working, I forgot to eat. It's like, that, like how could that happen? That is inconceivable to me. It's like, I don't know. Uh, and I do know what that murder means, by the way. Okay, um, poor, poor in spirit. Mourning, meek, hungry for righteousness, persecuted. Blessed are you when you're persecuted? Really? Jesus is going to talk about that here in next weeks? That's where we're going through this series is what does it mean to be blessed? Now the temptation is for us to think about this, 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 this 
passage of scripture, the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, as kind of like Jesus has given us your list of stuff to do. Here's your list. Do this stuff, and then you'll be blessed. But that is, that is a way to, that is not what Jesus is doing here. Basically, he's listing, he's telling us things that he's going to live out and that he's going to invite us into to be a part of. His family, his kingdom. And this, this listing of, 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 of actions and attitudes and things are not in order that we may be his children, but because we are, we're invited to live this way. To be, because we are his kids, we are his family, we are his children, we're invited into his kingdom. Live like this. Poor in spirit, mourning, meek, hungry for righteousness, persecuted for righteousness. That's where we're going. Matthew 5, chapters 1 through 3. We're going to learn about what it means to be poor in spirit. That's where we're going to today. So let me read Matthew 5, 1 through 3. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, uh, this is your word. Help us as we think about what it means to be poor in spirit. You know... This upside-down world that Jesus is inviting us to, to be a part of, and it's really to see the world accurately, to see it truthfully. He's going to invite us into this, and it's going to, and it's going to go against our grain, but it's going to set us free because it's the truth of the gospel. Poor in spirit, what does it mean? To be poor means to be dependent. To be poor in spirit is to be dependent upon God. First of all, I just spoke about how in Confirmation we talk about, you know, the three articles of the Apostles' Creed. We're just going through that now in Confirmation. So we talk about the first article. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. God is a creator of all things. And we are part of that created order that he has given to us. And that we are dependent upon God. That we are powerless to create ourselves. Now, the temptation is to go, well, you know, Pastor Rich, I worked hard for my money. I worked hard to make, you know, the hockey team. I worked hard to, you know, get these good grades. I worked hard for my retirement. I put my time in. And, you know, like, I'm not, you know, like, I'm getting what I deserve, what I earn. Really. Did you create yourself? Did you speak yourself into existence? Did you create your mind and your brain? Does your heart beat at your order and your command? All those, all those abilities, everything that your hands, you, did you create them? Did you make them? Are they yours? Well, they're yours, but they're on loan from God. We live and breathe and move because God has given us everything. My next breath is a gift from God. Our life is a gift from God. So every resource that we have, every talent that we have every, is a gift. It's a gift from God. And all we do is use it and go, wow, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What a beautiful thing you've given to me. We are dependent to be in poor in spirit is to realize that we are dependent upon God for our very existence, our very life. Sets us free to be who we are. To be poor in spirit is to realize that we're dependent upon God, not only for very life, but to right the wrong of our own heart. To be poor in spirit is to come before God and realizing our need for forgiveness and mercy, and that we have nothing to offer but sin and brokenness before a holy and righteous God and to plead for mercy. It's the message of Scripture before when God, when God meets someone, when God shows someone their life, their proper response is to go, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. It's what David did in Psalm 51 when he was when he revealed his brokenness and his sin, his adultery with Bathsheba. He says, against you and you only have I sinned. 
God, have mercy on me. Jesus told a parable about two guys. He told the parable about the Pharisee. It's Luke 18, and he tells it about the Pharisee who came in and said, Lord, thank you that you have not made me like the other people. Then he tells about this tax collector. Now, he used, the, he used a tax collector for a purpose. Now, we, we can't feel the weight of it, but a tax collector was someone who had kind of turned on his own people and was using his position to ingratiate himself to get wealthy, charge more taxes than he should. He was basically kind of, you know, in deal with the Romans, and he was a Jewish person. And so, and, and Jesus tells this story about the Pharisee. Lord, thank you, you've not made me like everyone else. I go to church, I tithe, I serve in the youth group, small group. I am quite a man. Modernizing it a little bit, okay? And then tax collector. God, have mercy on me. He saw himself as he was accurately. My friend, you have no, you have no power to atone for the sin of your heart. It would demand your life. God provides his own son, his son's life, as your sacrifice for sin to deal with the, the, the darkness of your own heart. He pays the price through the blood of his son. He atones for your sin. To be poor in spirit is to go, Lord, have mercy on me. And he does. <laughs> and he says, here's Jesus, here's my son. That's what it means. Because we're powerless to, to deal with the reality of sin. God have mercy. To be poor in spirit is to realize that we have no answer for our greatest enemy, death. We're powerless. Many of you, like me, were gripped by what we saw this week as we watched unfold on national television, uh, someone who had a heart attack, uh, Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin. He was playing in a, in a football game. In the middle of the game, he goes to tackle this guy, a uh, wide receiver, and he suffers a cardiac arrest. His heart stops on the football field. In the middle of the game, he falls over. And the, what unfolded was... Gripping, sobering, and, and caused people to think about themselves and the reality of their own mortality in a way that was powerful. Some of you saw it and know exactly what I'm talking about, paint the picture. He suffered a, a cardiac arrest. His heart stopped. He fell over right there on the field. Paramedics rushed out onto the field, performed CPR, the, the teams gathered around him. They started his heart again. They loaded him into an ambulance that pulled out onto the field. National television, this all unfolded. There were about 15 minutes that elapsed between his injury and the ambulance driving away, and those 15 minutes were just electric and unbelievably quiet and sobering as people watched this young man who is at the height of his physical life, right? Unbelievable athlete. I mean, listen, to be a professional football player in the football world, that's, that's it. And boom, he's laid down. <laughs> his life was revived. He went to the hospital, and he is now in critical condition, recovering. We have a picture of the distraught teammates. This is the picture that was taken during uh, when they were performing CPR, and you see the, 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 the distraught on their faces. Like, they're going like, I can't believe it. <laughs> what's happening? Here's what's happening. What Isaiah says, all men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord falls on them. We're not as powerful as we think, my friends. We're not. Our life, our breath is a gift from God. There's a, there's a beautiful picture. And 
What was the response? The team gathered around and they knelt on the field and they prayed. Now, you know, we don't know all that's going on, obviously. You know, and the city could go, well, they're just praying because, you know, that happened. Well, that's true. But can we acknowledge this one thing? That there were people who were brought face to face with the reality of death. And they said, there's a God. And I'm going to ask him for help. You know, to be poor in spirit is to go, I've got no answer. I've got nowhere to go but to go to God for help. That's what it is to be poor in spirit. That's what it means. To face that reality of, of our own mortality, of our own inability. And so, you know, yeah, we don't maybe have the dramatic thing going on in your world like that happened in Damar Hamlin's world, right? But there's maybe something going on and you go, I don't know what to do. And God goes, yeah, it's okay. The kingdom of God is, kingdom of heaven is yours. It comes to the poor in spirit, to the one who goes, I don't know. I don't know what to do with my family. I don't know what to do with my kids. I don't know what to do with my marriage. I don't know what to do with my job. I don't know what I'm going to do. What should I do? God goes, it's okay. <laughs> when we turn to, and go help to the Savior, he goes, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Now you're in a place where you can re- you're properly understanding yourself and me. And the kingdom of heaven is yours. Like, no, but no, one wants to, no one wants to go there, right? No one wants to acknowledge that. I mean, but the reality is, it usually takes God kind of getting our attention. Man, I heard it from so many different people on so many different news things this week. As people go, man, I mean, young men thought, I never knew that death was an option for me, <laughs> right? I never knew it was possible. It's like, yeah. You're like grass. We fall. We're mortal. Our life is temporary. And the good news is, that's where God's kingdom comes. That's who it comes to. It's the one who understands who we are. And God goes, you're mine. The one who's full of themselves, trusting in their own ability. They're not seeing life accurately. And God says, accept the reality of who you are. So the, re- the hard thing is, you know what, we have these moments, and you know, for these football players, you know, this moment, will it pass? Will, will they, will they kind of walk in that reality? And I think that's a challenge for all of us, because, you know, the reality is we kind of maybe hear a church, we sing, and we, and we hear these words, and we agree, but as we go through life, and we kind of face the nitty-gritty, we forget, and we kind of go like, well, it's all up to me, and we get proud, and... and it shows up maybe in our relationships with one another, right? We're not, we're not quick to admit our need, our brokenness, our selfishness in our relationships. To live out this, this, this reality of being poor in spirit shows up in ways like the ability to admit we're wrong. A humility, a humility in how we relate to one another, in listening. To realize that Okay, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Maybe I don't know it all. Maybe I can learn from somebody else. Poor in spirit. Uh, There's a a book that my uh, Karen and I have used in our home from time to time called Every Moment Holy. It's a book of readings and devotionals, uh, basically readings, kind of liturgies that for different situations and. And uh, it's a great book for families to use, uh, couples. And there's a, a reading that we're going to end this with. And the reading uh, basically is about kind of starting your day. And we're going to read it on the screen and going to invite us to close with this prayer. And I've also actually made copies of this, and they are at um, the Connection Center out in the atrium. So we got a number of copies. You can take one with you. And you can use it throughout your day because, you know, the challenge is for us to ex- experience that poorness of spirit here, but to walk in it, right? That's the hard part, 
in the day in and day out. That's why we need one another. We need kind of daily habits of readings and customs. So I encourage you to, for your uh, use to think of, of using this. And this is a way to kind of firmly grasp, to put that into practice, that poorness of spirit, to refresh our minds and our souls, renew our minds in that reality. So I'm going to do is invite you to stand. We're going to read it. It'll be on the screen. Read this together as our closing prayer. Join me. I am not the captain of my own destiny, nor even of this new day, and so I renounce anew all claim to my own life and desires. I am only yours, O Lord. Lead me by your mercies through these hours that I might spend them well, not in harried pursuit of my own agendas, but rather in good service to you. Teach me to shepherd the small duties of this day with great love, tending faithfully those tasks you place within my care, and tending with patience and kindness the needs and hearts of those people you place within my reach. Nothing is too hard for you, Lord Christ. I deposit now all confidence in you that whatever these waking hours bring, my foundations will not be shaken. At day's end, I will lay me down again to sleep, knowing that my best hope is well kept in you. In all things, your grace will sustain me. Bid me follow, and I will follow. Amen.